Jacob, issuing blessings to all his sons. And to Judah, we see an interesting set of promises. Let's read it again. Genesis chapter 49, verse 8. Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. You are a lion's cub, Judah. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness who dares rouse him. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nation shall be his. He will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. He will wash his garments in wine, his robes will be the blood of grapes, his eyes will be darker than wine, his teeth whiter than milk. So to Judah, like I said, we see an interesting set of promises. First, we see that he would receive praise from his brothers. He would receive prosperity and victory and power. And in verse 10, it mentions this scepter. This is an interesting thing because this scepter represents something. Traditionally, someone who would hold a scepter would be royalty. And so the scepter represents that royalty or it represents rule of some kind. And so the tribe of Judah, once David is made king later, do in fact take on that rule, that control. And it says that they will rule until the scepter is given to whom it belongs. And to whom does that rule ultimately belong? God. Thus, the Messiah, the person that we were talking about in, this, in these prophecies, must be divine. Because if the scepter is um, rightly God's, then whoever is that king must also, that ultimate king for all eternity, must also be divine. And if we know Jesus, or consider Jesus to be the Messiah, do we know first that he fulfills these roles? Do we know him first to be from the tribe of Judah? We actually have to establish that. Did he come from this tribe? Because that tribe was a lineage that had to take place for the Messiah. The Messiah had to be from that tribe. So do we know Jesus to be from the tribe of Judah? And second, do we understand Jesus to be divine? Well, we're gonna do some turning in your Bibles this morning. So hang with me and, I'll, I'll, and we'll go through some things. But the first place I need you to turn is the book of Matthew chapter one. Because we're gonna look at Jesus's royal lineage. Matthew chapter 1. This is one of those genealogies that people often skip over in the Bible because it's, okay, so-and-so begot so-and-so, and he was the son of this person and the father of that person. And it doesn't seem to be saying a whole lot. But guess what? It's in Scripture for a reason. And one of the reasons why this genealogy, we also find a, a, a genealogy in Luke, uh, exists is to show the royal lineage of Jesus. Check this out, verse 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Okay, so now we're going to see Judah's line here. Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Aminadab, Aminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon, the father of Shalmon, Shalmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Bathsheba. So, just stopping there, we see the line from Judah, right, to David. And we know that David was made king. And we know that David was made king because in 2 Samuel chapter 7, we see what's called the Davidic covenant. So keep your finger in Matthew chapter 1 because we're going to come back to it and go to 2 Samuel chapter 7. See, I cheated. I marked all my pages first so I can get there quicker. 
This is the promise, starting in verse 8, that God makes to David. So we see Judah going to David. Judah was promised that the kings were going to come from his line. And here's the promise that we see to David. It's called the Davidic covenant. In verse 8 of 2 Samuel chapter 7, it says, Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone. Now I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel. And will plant them so that they no longer, uh, sorry, they will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore as they did at the beginning and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. And when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will rise up, I will raise up your offspring to secede you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name. Talking about Solomon. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. That's talking about the Messiah. I will be his father. He will be my son. When he does... Uh, wrong, talking about Solomon, and I will punish him with a rod wielded by men with floggings inflicted by human hands, but my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. So now we have the promise to David. So we see the line from Judah to David, and now we have this promise to David. Now let's go back to Matthew chapter 1. And let's continue on with this genealogy from David, starting in verse 7. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of um, Jehoram. Jehoram, the father of Uzziah. Uzziah, the father of Jotham. Jotham, the father of Ahaz. Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. These are all kings, guys. You read about them in First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. Okay, these were all kings. Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Ammon. Ammon, the father of Josiah. And Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile of Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shetail. Shetail, the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, the father of uh, Abahud. Abahud, the father of uh, Eliakim. Eliakim, the father of Azar. Azor, the father of Zadok. Zadok, the father of Achim. Achim, the father of Elihud. Elihud, the father of Eleazar. Eleazar, the father of Mathan. Mathan, the father of Jacob. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. And Mary was called the mother of Jesus. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, who was called the Messiah. Thus, there were 14 generations all in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile of, to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. So now we see... We see the promise that was made to Judah. We see the promise that was made to David. And now we see the coming of the Messiah in Jesus. From David to Jesus, we see direct lineage, royal lineage, human bloodline, human bloodline. Now, skip over to Revelation chapter 5 real quick. Revelation chapter 5. And look at this. This is really neat. I think it's neat. (laughs) Revelation chapter 5. We're going to look at verse 5 through 10 here. It's talking about the Messiah here. He says, Then one of the elders said, Sorry, then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. That means one of David's descendants is going to triumph. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. And then I saw a lamb 
looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes. We're going to talk about that here in a little bit, um, which are the seven spirits of God sent out unto all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain and your blood and the with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nations. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. So we see this descendant of Judah, Lion of Judah, right, is the same as this lamb that was slain. Both are one and the same, and they're the one who, he is the one who's worthy to take the scroll, and he is the one who's going to establish the kingdom forever. So we see all through from Genesis to Revelation, it's all about this person, the Lion of Judah, the Lamb of God. So we see a royal lineage in the physical human person of Jesus. But the bigger question is, is if the Messiah is supposed to also be divine, was Jesus also divine? Well, because there is a common argument that suggests Christ never claimed to be God, believe it or not, this is a common argument um, that was actually introduced in the uh, late 70s by theologians such as a guy named Bill Hicks. But we have to address that question. We do. Why? Because if Jesus never claimed divinity, then it was something that his followers thrust upon him. And his fact was not true. So, did Jesus claim to be God? Well, one of the first things that we have to look at in this question is, is his relationship to Jewish authorities throughout the Gospels. Christ had the audacity to challenge certain things in Jewish law. Now, what is this saying about how Christ saw himself? Well, he's saying that he had the authority to challenge these things because he in, of himself is God. Now, it goes beyond that, of course. It does go beyond that because, as you'll see here in a little bit, when he did challenge these things, the priests and the elders cried blasphemy which we think okay they're just getting mad at him but no the reason they cried blasphemy is because what he was doing was was making the insinuation that he had the right as god to do these things to challenge those things check out though one of my favorite passages in scripture matthew in matthew chapter 16 um, i'm just going to read it for you here 15 through 19 what Peter says about Jesus. Jesus asked him the question. He said, but what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? We'll go back a little bit, verse 13. He said, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So Peter's con confession is interesting because Peter turned around and looked at Jesus and said, and Jesus said, who do you think I am? And Peter goes, you're the Messiah. You're the one. Notice what Jesus didn't do. Say, uh, no, that ain't right. He, he didn't rebuke him for it. He didn't. Uh, admonish Peter for calling him the Messiah. 
And instead, what did he say to Peter? This is, st- this is something my father gave you and you are blessed because of it. And in fact, it's that confession of Peter that the church is going to be built upon. The confession that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. That's the confession the church is going to build, build upon. So Jesus indeed claimed divinity. And he accepted worship. Jesus accepted worship. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 23, Jesus walks on the water, right? And he calls Peter out on the water. You guys are familiar with this story? Peter uh, starts to sink as he sees the waves and Jesus you know, picks him up, throws him back in the boat. Well, it says in that moment in Matthew chapter 14, verse 23, that they worshiped him. They worshiped Jesus. And again, we see the same thing. Jesus being worshiped in John chapter 9, verse 38, where... Jesus heals a blind man. And the Pharisees, they investigate and, and uh, this guy, and they've been thrown out of the synagogue, and Jesus identifies himself as the son of man, and the man who was healed worships Jesus. And in neither of those did Christ rebuke their action. Now, you want to compare that to something. Compare that to the angel that John sees in Revelation, where John bows down to the angel, and the angel says, don't worship me. I'm a created being just like you. Jesus instead accept that, accepted that worship as God. Throughout the book of John, there's something else that's very interesting about Jesus. Jesus makes a number of statements that begin with the phrase, I am. Now that might sound very, uh, not, like that, it's like, not like that a big deal. However, these are direct references to an incident in the Old Testament at the burning bush. Because at the burning bush, God identifies himself as the I am, Yahweh, the I am, the ever existent one. And when Jesus makes a statement in uh, John um, uh, 10, 30, he said, I and my father are one. And when he sits there and he makes a statement, before Abraham was, I am. He is declaring himself equal to Yahweh. He's saying, I am. I'm the same. And so this is why, this is why the Pharisees wanted to kill him. Because they saw that as blasphemous. Equating himself with God. In one of the passages we read earlier, Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. And this is a title used in Daniel 7 to refer to someone who would be given eternal rule over everything. And so when Christ describes his return in Matthew 26, 64, the Pharisees immediately cried blasphemy when he said, uh, called himself the son of man. So did Jesus claim to be God? Yes. Now, just because he claims to be God doesn't necessarily mean that he is God. Right? It's the whole liar, lunatic, Lord uh, sermon. If you've ever heard that one, I'm not giving you that sermon this morning, okay? But if, you're, if you don't know it, check it out. But if he is God, though, if he claims to be God, then one of the things that he needs to have are the essential attributes of God himself. We went over these a while back ago, the attributes of God. These are, these are them. Uh, the first three I call the omniristics, and we'll get into this. And we have to see, does Jesus fulfill these things? I mean, because how can a human being, a man, be omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient? I mean, we might even consider the, the thought that, that uh, in Mark chapter 13, verse 32, when it talks about how the son doesn't know the time of the return, well, then does that mean that Jesus is an omniscient? You know, does the Bible even argue against that? Well, what we find is that we find the answer in the book of Philippians chapter 2. And Philippians chapter 2 talks about how um, a man could be, uh, have these attributes, as a human being could have, have these attributes. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. Philippians chapter 2, verse 7 says, Rather, he made himself nothing by taking, on the, taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. This idea of making himself nothing, the term um, uh, talks about emptying himself. Empty him himself. It's called kenosis. And the term kenosis means that he emptied himself. And the question is, of what? 
Some say his divine attributes, but that would make him less God. Better is the idea that he emptied himself of the independent use of his divine attributes as he submitted to the will of the Father. And so that he functioned as God when the Father gave him sanction to do so. So he never gave up divinity. But the idea of emptying then is more of a change in status or role, not in nature or essential attributes. And that's what we're going to look at here, these essential attributes of God and see if Jesus actually had them. Because if he became nothing and submitted to the limitations of humanity, he could still have the essential attributes of God. Did Christ demonstrate that he had these attributes of God? Omnipotence means all-powerful. Did Jesus demonstrate himself to be all-powerful? I would say yes. In Matthew 28, 18, he says, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. In Matthew chapter 8, uh, verse uh, 26 to 27, he calms the storm. And though others have done miracles, you can see the power is attributed to Jesus as God himself. That's why, they, why you know, they were so quick to worship him. In John chapter 2, verse 11, he turned water to wine and it says that it revealed his glory. So yeah, I would say he demonstrates his omnipotence in the Gospels. But what about his omnipresence? Did he fulfill those? I'd say yes. Matthew chapter 18, verse 20 says, Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst. Matthew 28, 20 says, I am with you always, even until the ends of the earth. What about his omniscience? Is he all-knowing? Does he fulfill that essential attribute of being God? I'd say yes. John chapter 1, verse 48, he says, talks about how he saw Nathanael under the fig tree. And, and John chapter 16, verse 30 says that the disciples saw that he knew all things. And Mark 12, uh, or sorry, 2, 8, uh, he knew people's thoughts about him healing the paralytic. I want to go back to that Revelation passage for just a second because I find this fascinating. Revelation chapter 5 again. If you want to look there, that's great. Check this out. 5, 6. It says, Then I saw the Lamb, looking as it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The Lamb had seven horns. Okay? Now, horns traditionally are a symbol of power and rule. Seven is a perfect number. That means he has perfect power and rule. It's omnipotence. The omnipotence of the Lamb is seen. Seven eyes. Well, that was easy. Omniscience. Perfect sight. Right? And then you see the seven spirits. That's your omnipresence because the spirits are there. Perfect spirit. It's really kind of cool. I find it. I find it fascinating. Well, what about these other ones? What about his eternality? Was Christ created? Or was he creator? Well, in John chapter one one, we are familiar that in the word was the uh, the word in the word was God, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The word was in the beginning, and then if you skip down to verse fourteen, it says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So yeah, there's this eternality that he was there. John three sixteen is an interesting passage because it denotes that Christ was unique to God, the one and only Son. King James Version you might be familiar with, begotten. Begotten means, uh, suggests that the Son had the same nature as the Father. Thus Christ has that nature. Colossians chapter 1.15 talks about uh, His standing as authority and position as heir. Revelation 1, 8 and then 22, 13 t talks about how he's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning, the end. And going back to that one passage of uh, the I Am passage in John chapter 8, 58, where he says, before Abraham was, I am. That denotes eternality. Was Jesus perfect? I say the Bible talks about it. Hebrews 1.3 says the Son is the exact representation of God's being. And Hebrews 4.15 says that um, he was tempted but did not sin. Also in Hebrews, we see his immutability. We see Hebrews 1.12. 
where it says, you remain the same, your years will never end. Hebrews 13, 8 says, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So, we see he claimed to be divine. We see him fulfilling divine attributes of God. How can this be possible? And that takes us back to that Philippians passage. Philippians chapter 2. It's something called the hypostatic union. The hypostatic union. I know there's a big fancy theological term. But we have to realize there are things that are called essential properties and non-essential properties. Essential properties are those that are necessary for an object to have in order to remain being that kind of ad object. For example, an essential quality of a sphere, 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 I said it right, sphere, sphere, okay, uh, is that it's round, right? If it's not round, by nature, it's not a sphere, okay? A non-essential one, property is one that can change and the item can still be that kind of thing that it is. For example, if we talk about our sphere, if it's red in color, right? If it were the same thing but changed to green in color, it'd still be a sphere. As long as the shape didn't change, right? Okay, so, so we have listed, what we listed before were these essential attributes of God and Christ indeed met all of those requirements for both without being merely human and possessing limiting characteristics that would deny his divinity, like the lack of omnipotence or, sin, or if he was sinful. See, the union of man and the divine must be understood that it is two natures in one person. That's the, that's the hypostatic union. Two natures in one person, meaning it is complete and constant. It's not half and half. It's not half God, half man, right? He's 100% deity, 100% human. It's not some form of schizophrenia. It's not even where he's one nature at one time and another nature at other times, which some people will argue. There are times when one nature er, seems to be able to do things that the other can't, for example, in the humanity of Christ does not guarantee um, erroneousness or sinfulness, but his deity does. Okay. Therefore, the person of Christ is a unification of both deity and humanity. And even when we attribute, um, even when an attribute is true of one nature, it is the whole person is the subject. And we have to understand that. And why is this so important? Why is this so important? Because it seems like this is a theological thing that's kind of deep and, and, and weighty and hard to grasp sometimes. But it's important for this reason. The hypostatic union, God being, Jesus being 100% deity and 100% um, human, qualifies Jesus to be the Messiah. Remember what we said before? He had to be a royal lineage and he had to be divine, which means he had to be both man and God. He had to be both. Okay? And so in the Old Testament, they describe throughout the Old Testament different offices of who the Messiah was going to be. You may have heard it put prophet, priest, and king. You may have heard it put that way before. We're talking about the king today. Well, next couple of weeks we'll be talking about prophet and priest. Okay? Just doing it a little bit uh, uh, in a different order. But what this does is it qualifies him to fulfill the office of king. It fulfills himself. It, fulfill, it gives, yeah. It allows him to fulfill the office of of king the fact that his deity and humanity are fully united gives jesus the qualification not just to be king on earth but to be king in heaven as well anytime the word lord is used in scripture it refers to jesus's kingship okay christ is referred to as lord on many occasions Paul calls Jesus Lord in 1 Corinthians 1, 2 through 3, and again in Philippians 1, 2, and in Matthew 4, 7, Jesus refers himself to the Lord when he's talking to Satan. You should not tempt the Lord your God. Jesus even calls himself Lord. That's talking about his kingship. But in that Philippians chapter 2 passage where it really defines the hypostatic union idea, 
If you have, if you have your Bibles, go there and we'll, we'll check it out. We're going to look, look really quick. We see in verse 6, his divinity. But if we go back just a little bit, we know he's talking about Jesus because it says in verse 1, it says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility value yourselves above, uh, about, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So we're, there's no confusion. He's talking about Jesus here. And in verse 6 he said, who, who being in very nature God. In very nature God. And he says he did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. So now we see his de deity in verse 6, his humanity in verse 7. And if we look at the rest of this passage, and he says, as in verse 8 it says, And being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Look at verse 9 through 11. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name Jesus of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's his kingship. That's his kingship. He's exalted on the throne and everyone will bow a knee to him as king. And then, so it's that important that these things work together because that is the prophecy of the Messiah. Now, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at the prophecies that show how Jesus was also going to be a prophet and a priest. But until then, we have to realize the fact that Jesus fulfills the first of these three offices, that he indeed is the divine king of kings and lord of lords. He is the lion of Judah and the lamb of God, and that lamb was slain for us. And that's what we do, that's what we remember when we celebrate communion. So those of you who are joining us online, um, we're going to end it here. We're going to celebrate communion uh, together. And uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, we'd love to see you here uh, next Sunday. God bless everybody.